It is my pleasure to reintroduce to you Reverend Michael Record, who is known to us as Reverend Michael, but who is known to Jamaica and the world as a writer, uh, an award-winning playwright, and, and I hear an actor sometimes, right? He also is a teacher who teaches at several universities, not only in our church. We have to share him, but we treasure him, and we treasure his sharing with us this morning. Welcome to the podium, Reverend Michael Record. Thank you, Reverend Sonia. One of the things that I like about Sonia, you see, is that she, in a way, symbolizes this church. This church attracts scientists. There are a number of scientists here and people who think in a scientific reasoned, logical way. I'm talking about doctors and other talks, sorts of scientists, and I'm talking about lawyers. So it attracts scientists, but it also attracts artists. And we have a number of people who have been on stage and who are involved in artistic endeavors, whether jewelry or painting or et cetera, et cetera. And Reverend Sonia is both an artist and a scientist. Whenever she sings, I says, wow, boy, that voice is trained. And her husband, too, who is sitting here, is also artist and scientist. They, as I'm saying, symbolize this church. And I really like that, <laughs> the division, shall we say? except that there's a unification too, because this church is religious science. And you don't often see those two words together, religion and science. Good morning, friends. I greet you who are worshiping here in the Temple of Light on this abundance-filled morning in beautiful Jamaica. And I also greet you who are listening to me via the internet. I ask Reverend Sonia to give the inspirational reading titled The Truth About Abundance, because that is, in a way, the topic that I'm addressing this morning. But let me just highlight something that was read by her earlier. There are things which seem to be true, and there are things which are true. Poverty and lack seem to be true, but they are not real. They are only aspects of abundance. You can't give somebody poverty. You can't give somebody lack. And you can't take away poverty or take away lack. But you can give somebody abundance. You can give them money. You can give them cars. You can give you can houses, etc. You can give abundance. Abundance is real. Poverty and lack are not real. They are seeming things. They seem to be real but they are aspects of the true thing. They are aspects of abundance. It's a bit like light and darkness. You can't give somebody light darkness. You can't put darkness in a bottle and give it to somebody. You can give somebody light. You can put light in a bottle like a candle or a flashlight, etc. Light is real. Darkness is an aspect the opposite of, the absence of light. Poverty is the absence of abundance. Abundance is the real thing. And that's what I'm talking about this morning. 
you will probably agree with me that conservatively around the world a million prayers a minute are being directed to God. Conservatively. Most of those praying are asking God for stuff. My question to them, those who are praying for stuff, for abundance, for things, is what more do you want from God? That's the title of my talk. What more do you want from God? Please think carefully about who, how you would answer that question. Think about how you'd answer it now and think about how you would answer it after my talk. Hopefully it might shift your perspective a little bit. Please put up your hands if you want to get, do, or achieve something really, really badly. My hand is up. Good. Keep, keep, keep. <laughs> very clever, very clever. I, I, I deliberately put in that word. Keep your hands up if you think about it every day and how much you really, really want it. My hand is remaining up. Keep your hands up if you have been thinking about it. This is crucial. If you have been thinking about it for more than a year. Okay, hands down. Serious problem there. You notice though that my hand stayed up. And I think that I, we, should get out of that boat that we are in. i tell you why. It might surprise you because we've all been told that we should keep focused on our goal. That diligence, look at the board, look at the lectern, otherwise called stick to itiveness, is a virtue. But I have now discovered that, that I, and maybe you too, think about it, have been focused on the wrong thing. I have been focused on the wanting of the good, the goal, and not on the achieving. I have been focused on the lack of the goal. That's why I've been thinking about it for more than a year and not on the goal itself. Tell me what happens when we focus on lack. We get more lack, we all know it. What we focus on, we get. This is, I spoke about science, where you put your energy, that thing grows. Science. Professor? True. Two professors sitting side by side, both of them nodding. <laughs> it's easy to have the wrong focus. For example, many of those praying millions are focused on how poor they are instead of how rich they are. And the law of attraction, which is a fundamental law of the universe, states that like attracts like. So if you focus on poverty, you'll get poverty. Just listen or read the news and you'll agree that millions of people are focused on how bad things are in the world, including Jamaica, instead of how wonderful the world is. They are focused on how terrible their domestic lives are instead of the good things in their lives. Am I right? Yes. Good. I never hear enough people. As, as if I'm not talking the truth. You can't plant corn and reap peas. Science. You can't plant negative thoughts, and by that I mean unhappy, depressing thoughts, in your consciousness and expect to be happy. 
And since we all want to be happy, we have to focus on what? Absolutely, science. Please talk up, talk up. We have to focus on happiness. No ifs, no buts. No ifs, no buts. That really is my lesson for today. You've been such a bright class. <laughs> I wish more of you had answered though. So that, that is in essence. But I can't ask the ushers to come up yet. It's, it's not their time. So let me tell you how I came to realize that my focus was misplaced. It all started about a month ago in my speech writing and public speaking class. A student in fulfilling an assignment told a heartbreaking story about her relationship with her father. While she was growing up, though her father lived with her and her mother, she didn't get much chance to see him as he drove a taxi and was usually not in the house when she was at home and awake. To see him when he came in at midnight, she took to sleeping on the living room couch. But because he, as he told her after, because he had been given away when he was three, given away, he said, like a puss kitten by his mother, he didn't know how to parent properly. All he could find to talk to my student about was her schoolwork. So she studied very, very hard and got excellent grades right throughout school, right into university, so that he would be proud of her. Unfortunately, he didn't have a good relationship with her mother. And one day, the mother told him to leave her house. My student hadn't heard about this before and was surprised one afternoon to see her dad and a moving truck come for his furniture. And she watched in dismay as he started moving his stuff out. When he came to the couch that she slept on, not her bed, but the couch to see him, and she had become attached, to which she had become attached, she refused to get up. If he was leaving her, he darn well was not taking her couch. She associated it with the father that she loved. Her dad became angry and he started shouting at her. She shouted back and eventually he left the couch with her, crying. It was the first time she had ever seen him cry. And she later learned that he and her mother had agreed that he would leave the matrimonial bed to her mother and he would take the couch to sleep on in his new premises. He didn't have any other thing to sleep on. My student's story went on for 30 minutes instead of the allotted five. It was supposed to be a five minute talk. But of course, it would have been cruel to stop her. She had to get the story out to relieve herself, to relieve her pain. And of course, she was crying while she was telling it. Besides, I felt that her classmates would have lynched me if I had tried to stop this wonderful human interest story, we call it human interest story. She spoke of failed attempts on both her part and her father's part over the next dozen or so years to get together, for they really did love each other. She invited him to her fifth form graduation. He was busy and he couldn't make it and he broke her heart again. He sent her the most expensive gold watch she said she had ever seen with a note apologizing for his absence. Her response, she has never put it on. He invited her to be bridesmaid at his wedding. She refused, and so on and on again. Again, the two just never quite connecting. 
refusing the overtures of the other. And this went on until she was in her late 20s. So this is from her teens, 14, 15, right into her late 20s. Then she got a phone call one day that he had had a massive heart attack and was in a coma. She rushed to the hospital and heard he had just come out of the coma and he was calling for her. I tell you, there was not a dry eye in the class when she told us how she got into the bed with him, pushing aside the tubes bleeding up from all parts of him. And they hugged each other for the first time in about 20 years. She ended the talk with the good news that she and her father are slowly, awkwardly, getting closer together. And she naturally expressed regret that it was the imminence of death that brought the situation, that situation about. The following Friday, this class of mine is on a Friday evening, the following Friday, another student, an officer from the JDF, told his story involving the absence of fathers. This one is about the score, uh, scores of at-risk teens who went for training at a national youth service camp in some remote area of the island. Most, if not all, of the youngsters didn't have a stable family life. And most, said the soldier, didn't have a father figure in their lives. In the camp, they faced more discipline than they had ever faced before. And many were initially rebellious. But when the camp ended after some weeks, they didn't want to leave. They had bonded with each other and with the supervisors too and had to be cajoled, enticed for hours before they would get back onto the buses to go home. I tell those anecdotes because I think that my first student, she's like the man who stopped complaining that he had no shoes only when he met a man who had no feet. She had a father that she didn't appreciate for nearly 30 years, while some of the teens at the camp had no father in their lives at all. Another quick story that I heard that weekend. At a family gathering in Montego Bay, my brother-in-law told us that his parents never, he said never, spoke about the accidental death of his brother when the brother was four and he was two. The subject was just too painful for them. But one day he told us when his mother was in her 50s, he noticed that she was extremely and uncharacteristically irritable that day. And he asked her if she knew what the day was. It was the anniversary of her first son's death 30 odd years before. She said yes, she knew, because she thought about him every single day. That was why she was irritable that day. Years later, when my brother-in-law's father was in his 90s, this is many years later, he, his father, spoke about his first son's death, and he started crying at 90 about this death decades and decades before, eight years ago. Um, though the family was financially and socially very successful, neither parent had come to terms with the death, and that caused them to have great and, in my view, unnecessary unhappiness all their lives in that area. Those stories illustrate that people from all classes, all intelligences, focus on the negatives in their lives and so are not happy even if they are otherwise successful. They are not counting their blessings. 
The next step in my own appreciation of where, where my own focus should be came the following Sunday, this was the day after, when in his encouragement, Reverend John gave us a quote from Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our movement. I quote, a religious science church is a place where only two things happen. People are taught about a divine presence and a universal law of good which reacts to it. The law reacts to the presence. And people are taught how to use it. That's all. We have nothing else to sell. Unquote. Putting those words and the stories that I had heard together, I started discovering the subject of this talk. You know how these things get. I wasn't quite sure what I was talking about, but the stories and came together and I moved in this direction. People wanting to get more out of their lives. That's the topic. By way of research, I read some spiritual mind treatments in my creative thought magazines and found several that were relevant. Religious science minister Bill Thompson of Palm Desert, California has a treatment titled, I am surrounded by opportunity. One paragraph reads, I have a life that is abundant and full of opportunity. I see opportunity behind every door, around every corner, and in every encounter. Every opportunity is an invitation to meet someone new, try something new, go somewhere new, and even be someone new. I know these opportunities do not come to me by chance or by accident. They are part of the perfect process by which my life unfolds and I fully participate." Unquote. Bill Thompson. Reverend Jane Holt's treatment is titled, My Good is Available Now. And it states, in part, quote, the good I contemplate and express is the good reflected back as my experience. Unimpressed by temporary appearances, I keep my attention on the unchangeable truth, and my life continues to demonstrate greater and greater good as loving relationships, peace, radiant health, unlimited prosperity, fulfilling creative self-expression, and more." Unquote. And Dr. J David J. Walker's spiritual mind treatment, which is titled, I Am Complete, begins thus, I quote, my mind has within it everything necessary to function successfully as a human being. I think from and act with a consciousness that is complete because I individualize the mind of God and God is complete. My mind projects and accepts. It decides and creates." Unquote. You will have noticed that none of those writers is asking God for anything more. And here is what may be very well the best prosperity treatment that I've ever read. It's by Reverend Paul Gagne of Atlanta, Georgia. And it is titled, I Have All I Need. I hope you find it as good as I do. Please repeat it after me and consider the implication of each sentence. I will give you line by line. The same power that created the universe is a personal power in my life. The same power that created the universe is a personal power in my life. It created me with the capacity to live, love, and prosper. It 
places me in a world full of joy and abundance. He places me in a world full of joy and abundance. It gives me the wisdom to put the two together. The way I choose to use this power always determines the way I live. The world does not need to change for me to succeed. Other people do not need to change for me to enjoy love. When I'm ready to grow, all that needs to expand is my belief in God as the ever-present source in my life. The source of my power is always within. I direct my thoughts with confidence, strengthening my belief with the passion of my heart, and the wisdom of God. My life is quickly and easily rearranging itself. to accommodate my belief. And so it is. That spiritual mind treatment was titled, I have all I need. Jesus said, some of you like the Bible, so I'm going there. Jesus said, it is done unto you as you believe. And if you believe you have all you need, since the infinite creative energy of the universe is yours to use, you should never feel lack. You will realize that what you want from God is not more abundance, but the wisdom to use what you have already been given. Namaste. Namaste.